Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. Fellow Kenyans, we have now embarked on a new phase in the war against COVID-19 pandemic. This is after yesterday's announcement by His Excellency the President that partially opened up the country, which included lifting of movement in restricted areas, in some restricted areas that, are that had been considered very high risk, or that are still considered high risk. However, I want to follow up on one point that the President mentioned, and that is the responsibility of ensuring that inter-country spread of the virus does not happen is purely one's responsibility. It is war that requires each and every one of us to assume active responsibility and become conscious not only of his own safety and that of his family, but also of others around them. As the president said, we must become each other's keeper. With the easing of restrictions, we can no longer look up to the police to enforce adherence of containment measures. Any slight imagination of this is a recipe for disaster because it is not realistically possible to deploy a police officer for every Kenyan. Therefore, as we look forward to another phase during this period of the pandemic, we must take a step back and reflect on our duty as individuals and as a people. Remember, there is no right without duty. Your duty is to observe and adhere to the, to the infection prevention measures that the Ministry of Health has been advocating for combating this disease. Talking about these containment measures may be repetitive, and indeed, there are those who find it uninteresting, even boring, uncomfortable. However, the coronavirus, as of today, still has no cure. Neither is there a vaccine, the only available means of defense against this pandemic is the containment measures that we have continued to give. And in doing so, as this new phase of our being responsible to ourselves begins, it has been going on, but since yesterday, let it be clear that the torch of responsibility as to whether you are safe or not safe has been passed to you, has been passed to the church, has been passed to the office, has been passed to the county government, has been passed to Kenyans in general. This responsibility is clear, and this responsibility is not difficult. We learned a long time ago what to do so that you don't get AIDS. And government does not think every day about not getting AIDS because you know what it is. Over the last over 100 days, we have told Kenyans every single day, every single day, we have told Kenyans exactly what to do so that you do not get the virus and so that you can save your family and your people. And we are so happy and so encouraged by all those who have picked up this motto and have continued to do so. As we travel around the country, we see people wearing masks. We see conscious people who will not allow you to come very close to them. We see conscious people who are staying away from their parents or keeping very long distances so that they can speak to them. And this is encouraging. But this is a new phase altogether. And one must ask yourself, we must ask ourselves as individuals, do I have to enter 
a crowded place knowing very well that I can get COVID-19. As I was walking down here, I got a call from Mombasa, from a friend of mine in Mombasa. And he said to me that the Gymkhana in Mombasa is full of people, nobody is keeping social distance, etc., etc. And I was disheartened to hear that that is what they are doing in Gymkhana. And for sure, even as we speak, the security, the security personnel are hearing this, and I'm sure they'll take the measures that they need to. But my bigger question was this to my friend. If you know that they are not keeping distances in Gymkhana, what are you doing there? Leave it. Walk away. If you know that a place is going to be crowded, why go there? Don't go there. If you know that a marketplace, the person who is, sending, who is selling you your commodities, your vegetables, and so on, does not care about corona, is openly speaking and spitting on your cabbages, why buy them? There are so many other people who are wearing masks. Why buy cabbages from a person who is not wearing one? If you can see that a matato is obviously not keeping the measures that have been given to the transport sector, and you can see it, you have a choice. You can either enter that matato and risk getting sick, or you can wait for the next one. The same case applies to a bus. If you are traveling on a bus from Mombasa to Busia, you are going to be in that bus for a while. If you can see people are not wearing masks, there are 60 crowded people in that bus, if you have one person in that bus, or two persons, who are COVID-19 positive, and you are traveling with them for 14 hours, chances are that by the time you get to Busia, the entire bus will probably be positive. You have a choice. Do you have to enter that bus? Just because His Excellency the President has said you can travel into and out of Mombasa, you are probably thinking this weekend, I quickly need to rush to Siaya to see my parents. And that's all very nice. But I think, I think, when we travel up country, we, 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 we take things to our parents and our grandparents. Unapereke sukari, unapereka mafuta, unapereka ile ingine, Lakini sahi vile vile, wea beba mask, wea beba sanitizers, wapeleke hizo pia. So that when you get there, among the things you present to your parent, um, to, your, to, your, to your relative, give them a mask and give them a sanitizer and keep your distance. So do I really visit my mother without a mask, knowing very well that I could either pass the virus to her or even kill her. Do I really want to do that? It's a choice. The government can't stop you from doing that. Do I really need to enter a place of worship where I am, keep, I am not keeping social distance and nobody is wearing a mask just because others are not doing it? Don't you have a choice to enter there or not to enter there? This is what it comes down to, my fellow Kenyans. This is the time when that responsibility is so grave, yet so important for us to maintain. And even if politicians call us for a gathering, am I duty bound to go into a crowded place just because my MP or another politician has called me knowing very well that I'm exposed, and if something happens to me, nobody cares, not even the person who has invited me, you have a choice. No policeman is going to tell you to attend, but you have a choice. This idea that only the police are going to stop things happening must come to an end. It is you who is going to make something happen, and it is you who is going to make it not happen. My appeal to you, therefore, is clear. Wash your hands regularly.
wear a mask, maintain social distance, and heed the counsel, the wise counsel of His Excellency the President in terms of behavior change. Let us not lower our guard, because doing so would be disastrous. Na mimi naitaendelea kuwasi wananchi. Tafadharini. Tafadharini. Wakati huu, sio silikali inakinga wewe. Ni wewe mwenyewe unajikinga kutoka kwa hii virusi. Na mimi nataka kuwasii kila nataka kusii kila mtu tafadhalini. Tafadhalini ukiwa ni matatu, ukienda kwa matatu na uonde katika hiyo matatu watu wamejaa. Usianze kusema ni polisi ni lazima waje hapa dio wamshike ama wamshukue wa, wa umdereva. Hapana jameni. Wewe unaigia hiyo gari kwa nini? Unaweza kupita barabara wakati unaona gari ikipita kwa mbio. Can you start crossing the road if a vehicle is moving very fast on that road? Kama uwezi kupita kwa barabara wakati gandi, ga, magari inapita na mbio, basi vile vile usikabilie mtu mwingine ambayo ambaye hana barakoa aweki hatua kwa hivyo jameni tusije tukafikiria kuna mtu mwingine ambaye sasa sisi anatuangalia ana, lazima wewe mwenyewe ujiangalie ujichunge jukumu la kibinafsi ni saa hii sio kesho jukumu la kulinda familia yako sio ya serikali sio ya polisi ni yako wewe mwenyewe binafsi ukiwa utaenda kutembelea mzazi uko kisumu ama nyeri ama kakamega basi sio tu kumpelekea mkate umpelekea mkate umpelekee barakoa ama mask umpelekee sanitizer umpelekee sabuni ya kunawa mkono kwa sababu hiyo chakula ambao unampelekea hiyo sukali ambao unampelekea ukimpelekea na ukae karibu na yeye na wewe hujui kama una virusi ama huna basi unajua ni kitu gani itafanyika kwa hivyo jameni ni lazima tugeuze ni lazima tugeuze vile sisi tunaishi hatuwezi kuendelea kuishi kawaida wakati ambao iko virusi ambayo sio ya kawaida fellow kenyans it is without doubt that this since this pandemic struck our country it has caused a lot of anguish and suffering to our people a good number of our people have checked in hospitals with mental related cases such as depression and others we have also witnessed an increase in family and gender based violence these psychosocial issues have compounded the problem of the current pandemic. The rising number of mental health related cases in the country, such as depression and other mental illnesses, some of which have in fact ended up in suicide, have been a concern to this government. And that is why, even before COVID came, His Excellency the President ordered the formation of a task force with a primary mandate to study the status of mental health in the country and recommend solutions to reform mental health systems. The task force was inaugurated on the 11th of December 2019 and comprised of a multisectoral team from the Ministry of Health and other agencies under the leadership of Dr. Frank Jenga here with us today. I'm therefore delighted that today I will receive the final report from the Task Force on Mental Health. This is the culmination of a huge amount of work over the past several months by the Task Force. In Kenya, it is estimated that one in every ten people suffer from a common mental disorder. The number increases to one in every four people among patients attending routine outpatient services. 
depression, and anxiety disorders are the leading mental illnesses diagnosed in Kenya, followed by substance use disorders. Among the different types of substances, alcohol contributes to the largest burden of substance abuse-related illnesses in Kenya. Of great concern, alcohol abuse is most prevalent in the 18 to 29 age group. Related to this high burden of mental illness are the increasing rates of suicide in our country. According to the World Health Organization, Kenya's mortality rate due to suicide is ranked 29th worldwide with an estimated 5.6 persons per every 100,000. Amid all these challenges, the country's total bed capacity for mental health care is 1,600, of which 400 are in the private sector. There are four public facilities providing treatment and rehabilitation services for substance use disorder and 14 county hospitals across the country for mental health care. Fellow Kenyans, a few of the key findings of the task force indicate the following. Kenya has a high burden of mental illness due to ill health, psychosocial disability, and premature mortality with huge gaps in access to care. Majority of Kenyans associate mental health and mental illness with negative narratives, leading to low focus on the importance and benefit of mental health and well-being. From the following findings, the task force has made the following key recommendations. The establishment of a mental health commission and happiness to advise, coordinate, and continuously monitor the status of mental health and report on the annual national happiness index. Declare mental illness as a national emergency of epidemic proportions to prioritize mental health as a priority public health and socioeconomic agenda. Provide adequate financing for mental health in line with international best practices. I would like to congratulate the team that um, worked so hard and so diligently, including the secretariat led by our own uh, Dr. Jogona, and to say and to tell the team led by Frank Jenga that the Ministry of Health, moving forward, we will take this matter very, very seriously. It is our intention to create a standalone semi-autonomous institution that will spearhead the reforms within the mental health care area. In addition to the construction of a world-class mental health facility, this ministry is committed to also training and ensuring that we have the top-notch facilities, resources in mental health care. Because by the end of the day, there is not one person who is designated as an individual who can become mentally ill. We are all candidates, and we can all, not to coin a phrase, get it. At this juncture, as I conclude by just giving you the figures for the day, ask um, uh, Frank uh, to say a few things on the presentation of uh, the report, and then we can take a few uh, questions from you. Today's statistics are that 183 people have tested positive to the disease from a lower figure of uh, samples of 2061. The total case now, total case load, now stands at 8,250 out of about 193,455 samples tested so far.
From those positive cases, 177 people are Kenyans, while six are foreigners. And in terms of gender spread, 119 are male, while 64 are female. In terms of age, the youngest is four years old, while the oldest is 79. Nairobi continues to lead with 100 people today. Mashakos at 37, Kiambu 14, Mombasa 13, Kajiado 11, 5 Nakuru, and Busia has three new cases. Nairobi, where the intensity is, Western Zaria has 30, the Kibera area has 20, Dagoretti North 17, Langata has 8, Embakasi East, Embakasi South, Starehe, and Makadara all have five cases each, while Kamukonji, Roisabur, Waraka, carry the other ones. You will get this in the report that um, we are going to issue to you, to you. The other details are also in the report. But for instance, in Kajiado, there are 11 cases. Kajiado Central has five. Kajiado North has three. Kajiado West has two. And Kajiado East has one. The Molo and Gilgil area in Nakuru have uh, one case each. The Nakuru West area has some three cases, uh, while Teso South and Matayos in Busia have two and one case respectively. Today, we are once again delighted to inform you that 90 patients have been discharged from various hospitals, bringing a total number of recoveries to 2,504. I want to thank our healthcare workers for their continued dedication to work, which has enabled us to achieve this result. Sadly, may I also report that three more patients have also passed on, bringing the fatality to 167. I want to send our heartfelt, condol our heartfelt condolences to the family and the friends of the departed. Finally, during this new phase that we have started in the fight against the disease, I want to make a special appeal to our people once again and repeat once again, please exercise individual responsibility. Our cooperation and unity in this fight will enable us to overcome and it is possible. I know that in many parts of the world, what has been happening is that as soon as they open up, within a week, they close down again. As soon as they open schools, they close down again. Essentially because as soon as you open, people think that you opened because you have now contained the disease. Let me make it clear. We did not open because we have contained the disease. We opened for two reasons. Number one is the balance between economic activity and our health concerns, predicated on the fact that we now believe that Kenyans can do both. We are convinced that Kenyans are responsible enough to be able to carry on economic activities while at the same time, at the same time, observing the measures to protect themselves and to protect their families. It is this belief in our people. It is this belief in Kenyans. It is a belief that we all care, and we all care so much that we care enough for us to be able to continue with what we are doing. The ball, as the saying goes, is in your court and in everybody else's court. I thank you. Uh, before 
before I take the questions, let me just ask uh, Frank Jenga to say something about um, the report, hand it over, and then we can take the questions. Cabinet Secretary, Bwana Mutahi Kagwe, Madam P.S., ladies and gentlemen, where you've stopped is where I will start, Bwana C.S., because at the center of the war against this COVID-19 pandemic is the behavior of us Kenyans. And it is a befitting moment that I do the presentation of the Mental Health Task Force at a time when we as Kenyans are being urged to behave ourselves. Last year, ladies and gentlemen, as you might remember, on the 1st of June in Narok, the president spoke as the president, as a husband, as a father, as a grandfather, and talked to us Kenyans about the increasing cases of depression that were, as they were then today, causing a great deal of pain and suffering in the homes where we all live. He directed, as the CS has said, the formation of the task force of which I was privileged to, ch to chair, and the dut duty conferred upon me in chairing the task force with Madame P.S. has opened the eyes of members of the task force in ways that I could not have believed possible. We visited many counties, we had submissions from many professionals and lay groups. We had church and academic groups present to us. And in every sense, we believe that as a task force, one of whose members, Professor Lukoya Tuoli, is here, that we heard and in the report faithfully recorded the pain and suffering of our people that is due to the very heavy burden of mental illness in our society. Our people told us many things, which you're welcome to read in the report. But there are one or two things. Stigma that is associated with mental illness. People are so afraid and shy of indicating that they are human beings who suffer from, say, depression or schizophrenia or PTSD, that they would rather stay with their illnesses at home rather than expose themselves to the shame of confirming that they are humans and suffer from mental illnesses. And therefore, they told us to tell you Kenyans and government in general, that we need to put in place systems and strategies for dealing with stigma. The second thing that they told us is that stigma is in part driven by the low resources that we associate or give to the treatment or to the management of mental disorders. And one of the recommendations, of which we have many, is that really if we are going to give mental health the dignity that it deserves, we really need to finance mental health services in a way that is com commensurate with the burden that is there. CS has mentioned a number of our recommendations, which we will be submitting to government today. I will mention only two, with your permission. The first one is in pursuit of two highly authoritative bodies that have recommended something similar. Number one 
in the year 2011, the United Nations recommended that nations, countries, evaluate and measure the extent of the happiness of their citizens. The Kingdom of Bhutan, for example, has a very sophisticated system of examining the mental health and happiness of her people. We are suggesting, Buona CS, that such a commission would be a good idea for ourselves. We, as a task force, were very pleasantly surprised and impressed by reading the BBI report, which coincidentally contains exactly the same uh, recommendation. So whether you come from the BBI side or from the UN side, our recommendation is right in the middle, and we strongly feel that a responsible body to monitor the mental health and happiness of our people would be a good thing. Secondly, Bonacias, and again you have mentioned this one, back in 1999, President Moy declared HIV AIDS as a national disaster because it had visited each and every home in our country and was decimating not only our people but also our economy. In a short period of time, that singular declaration led to a reduction of the prevalence of HIV infection for 14.5% to the present 4.8%. We are recommending an equally decisive declaration by our government that recognizes that too many people are dying either by suicide or by the root of gender-based violence or by the root of um, road traffic accident, Kowale Ambabe to Mia Pombe, and we would suggest that such a move will and can save life. Bonacias, allow me to, uh, to stop there, but to say this, the privilege of all of us of serving in this task force cannot be underestimated. As I've told you on the side, I First of all, I'm very happy that uh, the, the, the peers and yourself clearly have read this report and clearly you agree with some of our very many uh, recommendations. That is also new for people in high offices to actually read um, uh, reports. That's very good. But Bonacias, let me tell you something else that really gives me, as Frank Njenga Mze, a lot of hope for our country. And again, I've told you this. The, sec the members of the task force that were given to me to work with are brilliant men and women that promise a great future for our country. And secondly, the men and women that worked under Dr. Njuguna it, from this Afia house, we, we do not, people are telling us, to, oh, get people from Bangladesh, oh, get people from, for what? This is a Kenyan report done by Kenyans and if any of you has time to read it, you will agree with me that Kenyans have done an excellent job. When I see us, kindly accept our report with grateful thanks in the full knowledge that our report will find under your watch full implementation. Thank you so much, Bernard CS. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard Right. Um, before uh, the report is handed over, questions, and then we do the reports. Colonel? Okay. My name is Graham Kajilo from The Standard. Uh, the question I'd like to know is uh, about the resumption of um, flights, international flights from August 1st. Will those people who be coming in be uh, requested to self-quarantine or mandatory quarantine? And wh what will happen if um, there is an influx of a lot of people about the quarantine um, spaces? Yesterday also the, 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 the president mentioned about the preparation of the country. And he, may, he said that it's not 100%. So I'd like to know to what percentage are we, especially in the mandate that was given to, to counties to have at least 300 beds each. Um, 
I'm Purity Musa from KBC. Good afternoon. Um, a follow-up on what my colleague has said. Do we have any protocols, especially on those who intend to travel to rural areas, or how do, does the ministry intend to protect the elderly just the way you had imposed protocols for hotels mm -hmm. before they reopened? Do we have the same? And again, what happened to the mass testing? Today we saw 455 samples being tested. Why are we testing such a small number? And lastly, sir, uh, on the fatalities that you've announced, um, maybe you an elaboration on whether they had any underlying conditions or what exactly, uh, or they did not have any conditions, a clarification also on that. Lastly, to the DG, um, on the curve, are we yet at the peak of this? And as we reopen uh, the economy, do we expect a surge of this or how disciplined are Kenyans? My name is Nayoma Sampao from NTV. Uh, my Nayoma Sampao. Mine is a follow-up on uh, the officials who refuse to leave office even after they have attained the retirement age and uh, those who are supposed to be transferred. Would you kindly give us an update of whether you've resolved the issues? Sure. Thank you very much, Mark Namaso, AKTN News. My question concerning, uh, concerns the protocols that uh, uh, PSV vehicles, bus operators are supposed to meet. What are some of these uh, regulations are supposed to fulfill before they are authorized to proceed and uh, transport Kenyans up country? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'll leave some of the questions by purity uh, to my colleague. Uh, in terms of the underlying conditions, the testing, um, uh, the, the number of tests, as well as the other ones that you had asked. And then just talk about um, the international flights uh, by Graham. Um, uh, currently, the protocol that we have is that um, before you board a flight, you are supposed to have been tested and proved negative. That's number one. Number two is once you arrive in the country, you will be quarantined for a period of 14 days. That is the current protocol. Now, moving forward, as we come to the, um, uh, to the period that we are opening up international travel, what we are seeking for and what we are trying to consult with is the World Health Organization so that we can see whether it is possible to have one global position that we can take so that uh, a person traveling from the UK to here or traveling from here to the UK can experience the same, can go through the same experience whichever way it goes. So we will probably, by the time that uh, that position is cleared, we will probably be announcing either reinforcement of the same protocols or change in protocols. As far as the preparations of the counties are concerned, on this one, I want to say that um, the, the, the county governments, led by the county governors, have made tremendous progress as far as the preparations are concerned. And we have seen that we have published some of them, and we will continue to update you on uh, the level of preparedness that each county has. I have said it before. I believe that this is a period of great tests for the concept of devolution. Devolution is being tested here, ladies and gentlemen. And we have seen it work very well in some counties. And we have seen near failures in other counties. And therefore, my appeal, and I want to ride on uh, Graham's question, my appeal is to ask that leadership in all counties, the level of preparedness in any country, in any county, is directly proportional to the ability of the leadership of those counties. It is as simple, really, as that. And we are so impressed by some of the counties who have grown tremendous capacity that we believe that managed in a, in a, in a, in a, central, in a centralized way will probably not have happened. But we also urging, because in every county is likely, we pray that it doesn't happen, 
But it is likely that in every county, there will be cases. And right now, nobody can predict which counties will have a very big load once people start traveling uh, up country. It just behoves each one of the CECs for health, county governors, to just take a grip and simply be ready. Let me add a rider here. You know, for the benefit of everybody and fellow Kenyans, and the reason why it is so important to protect yourself wherever you are, there will be no lifting of people from counties to Nairobi. In a little while, as we see it, as we see the progress as we are in hospitals today, there will be no capacity for you to, take, uh, to be brought to Nairobi for treatment because chances are by the time you are being brought to Nairobi, Nairobi itself will already have been overwhelmed if it comes to that. And it's good to call a spade a spade instead of a big spoon. It's good to be honest with you fellow Kenyans. Where we are heading is so unpredictable that we cannot say that uh, the, account, the, 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 the hospitals that we have here in the city will cope. We don't know. We are doing our best. We are increasing capacity. We are increasing another 500 beds, for example, in KU. We are increasing the, uh, the, the treatment centers. We are moving uh, ventilators and other equipment into our hospitals. But that is not to say that we will cope. So if you are in Wajia, if you are in Nyeri, if you are in Kakamega, I think you should, as a citizen, part of your responsibility, you should be harassing your, your government to make sure that they have got the facilities to take care of you when you get sick. Because, listen to me, there will be no airlifting to Nairobi. Just like today, if you fell unwell, you know, people are not talking about going to India or going to London or going to the U.S. anymore. That is, what, that is how it is. And let's be honest and clear about it. I'm not painting a negative picture. I'm not painting a doomsday scenario. But I think it is better to be ready than to be sorry. And it's better for us to say these things rather than to hide them and, uh, and bury our heads into the ground like the proverbial ostrich. As for the protocols, purity, and matatus and so on, tomorrow, the CS for Health, CS Masharia, will be holding a meeting with circles, matatu owners, bus owners, in order for us and in order for them to clear the movement towards uh, upcountry from Nairobi and Mombasa and so on. Top of the agenda, of course, is the care the observance of the, of the measures that are already supposed to be in operation in the city. In other words, sitting, keeping your distances in the bus, wearing your mask, ensuring that anybody getting into that bus has been sanitized, ensuring that the bus itself is fumigated so that all germs are killed, the virus is killed before people enter, and once they arrive, before they start on the backward journey, the same thing happens. But these are protocols that will be discussed tomorrow, and these are protocols that will be issued tomorrow. Let me also say this, that the enforcement um, agencies are also a bit freer now. So when it comes to issues of curfew, you can be sure that there will be more vigilance, and there will be more policing to observe that the measures that are in place, as in curfew, the closure of bars and so on is very strictly observed. And people had begun to relax a little bit. You and I know that. Again, let's not, let's not hide from each other. There are those who have taken for granted that the country is now open and they can do whatever they wish. They can load up the matatos. They can continue to do so. Going forward, going forward, and in order for these measures that we are announcing to take place, and in order for us not to uh, create a, 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 a doomsday scenario, even as we open the areas of uh, containment, it, it, it behoves us then that as individuals and as enforcement agencies, we make sure that what we are saying is done. And so when we say we are going to close bars, 
we have gone on and closed the bars. And you know some of those bars, and we are going to be giving a list to you. When, our, when the bars are closed, we'll give you a list and tell you the following bars have been closed so that those of you who are planning to go there don't go there. As for the... Um, uh, uh, Nayuma, you asked about... Um, <laughs> the refusal of some uh, people to leave office when they have been transferred or otherwise. Wajua, hatuwezi, hatutaki, hatutaki. We don't want to humiliate anybody. Because when you have, been, when you have worked for the Ministry of Health, for as long as some people here have, our prayer is that when you are transferred or when you have been um, when, you are here, when your years have come when you have hit the age 60 tafadhali you know just go home peacefully nicely let's shake hands go and say hello go and say quietly to your colleagues because how long do you think it is tenable honestly you know so we don't want to humiliate people so I hear that there are some people who are still being seen around, you know. You know, one of these is I'm going to have to send a, a message to the grandchildren. You know, hashtag, kuja chukua mama. Hmm? Hashtag, kuja chukua baba. Huh? Hashtag, chukua babu tafadhali. Anyway, we are resolving these issues. Asanta sana. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amos. Thank you, Aziri. Uh, I, th I think the issue of uh, uh, protocol for travel up country, I've alluded to that. The same measures uh, will apply for PSV vehicles. Of course, now with the lifting of the restriction of movement, uh, many people will travel up country and there's potential of seeding of infections uh, up country. And we have worked with the county governments to ensure that we have protocols, uh, to ensure that we do screening at uh, various points of entry into each uh, county and this will involve well, amongst other things temperature checking we'll also have a symptomatology uh, triage where we'll be able to ask you a few questions especially if you have a fever whether you have a cough difficulty in breathing and categorize you appropriately there will of course be enforcement of the use of masks and other infection prevention control measures including hand washing and use of sanitizers. So this will apply across the points of entry in the inter-county movement as well as for the PSP vehicles. Uh, sample testing, yes, there are fluctuations in the number of tests that we do on a daily basis. Uh, and this is usually because of, we have two types of tests. We have what we call the manual test, which has a lower throughput and uh, the automatic one where we simply feed the specimens into the machine and it does the work for you so when we are running with the manual kits this slows us uh, down a bit but now i'm glad to report that we have the automatic kits and very soon again you see us ramping our testing capacity uh, for the mortalities that we have reported today again like with the previous cases uh, age of more than 60 years is a big risk factor any coexisting medical condition is also a big risk factor like the two people out of the three who died who are reported today one had chronic myeloid leukemia which is a type of blood cancer the other gentleman had diabetes but of note is the 30 year old who does who did not have any coexisting comorbidity so again this behoves us that the disease is here with us and nobody is immune you could be as fit as a fatal, but you get a more severe type of COVID-19 and you could easily succumb to the disease, notwithstanding that you don't have a, a comorbidity. Uh, our curve, yes, we have not hit our peak yet. And we told you a few months ago that as we approach our peak, we'll be reporting numbers in terms of triple digits. And for the past two or three weeks, we have always reported more than 100 cases. Our curve is predicted to peak at around uh, August, September. But as I've always told you, nature does not obey signs. It's very, very difficult to tell when we'll peak. But with the numbers and also opening of the or lifting of the restriction movements, if we don't 
exercise that responsibility and we see infections at the county level, then the peak could even come earlier, which will not be good for us because in that case, there's a risk that our healthcare system will be overwhelmed. I think that is all that came my way. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>